How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on Climate One, we discuss the pursuit of a clean energy economy with the U.S. Secretary of Energy. If we continue to innovate and drive down the costs of the clean technologies, that will permit the more aggressive ambition going forward. Also, we take a closer look at what the Paris Climate Agreement means for the economy and the climate. The most important thing about Paris is that everybody came to the table with a plan to decarbonize their economy. And what will matter is whether that gets done. But first, we delve into the concept of geoengineering, the notion of painting the sky to cool the planet. Humanity's relationship to the biosphere and the planet as a, a, a complex system that we can't hack, that's not the right word, but we might be able to finesse it in ways that will that keep us from causing a mass extinction of it. Up next on Climate One. Oliver Morton, let's begin with a story. 1965, uh, U.S. President Lyndon Johnson receives what is one of the, f the, the first time a, a U.S. president receives a report on climate change. And rather than talking about reducing the source, uh, Roger Ravel had a novel idea for addressing it. Tell us that story. So, well, Ravel has done the work in the 1950s that has shown that carbon dioxide is, contrary to some previous expectations, building up in the atmosphere. And he knows that this is going to lead to a level of greenhouse warming. And he puts this into the uh, report of the president in 1965. It's, a sort of like, it's an appendix to this, to this report. And he says, well, what should we do about it? And in 1965, talking to Lyndon Baines Johnson, you do not say, well, we're going to radically change the whole nature of capitalism. You don't say we're going to do anything about people making oil in Texas. Uh, you <laughs> say things like, we could put lots of little reflect reflective bubbles on the surface of the ocean and reflect back some of the sunlight. Uh, Ken Caldera, let's have you explain what is geoengineering. What's a, give us a brief explanation of this is a very abstract concept. How do you describe it? There are two main categories of geoengineering. If we think about the global warming that humans are producing, it's primarily due to the fossil fuel CO2 that we're adding to the atmosphere. And this, at, this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere makes it more difficult for heat to escape to space. And so one approach, which is relatively non-controversial, is to just remove some of the carbon dioxide that we're adding to the atmosphere. But if we think about what's heating the Earth up to begin with, it's the sunlight hitting the Earth and we're absorbing this solar radiation. And so another way to cool off the Earth would be to reflect some of that incoming sunlight back to space. And this is precisely what volcanoes do and the Earth has cooled after each of the large volcanoes that have occurred over the last 50 years or so. And so the other leading idea is basically to emulate what big volcanoes do, put material in the stratosphere to reflect sunlight. And there's a few other ideas as well, but they're all based on the same idea of reflecting sunlight back to space. The, the common understanding of this term geoengineering has <coughs> morphed fairly quickly to the notion that it would be a technological silver bullet where you could do one thing and solve the problem of us burning fossil fuels. So uh, people immediately object to it as a kind of a moral hazard that if we think that we can get away with it, that we won't decarbonize fast enough. And then also there's a certain resistance to the technocratic in general of uh, taking over of the, the not just uh, uh, world history, but even planetary ecosystems themselves by some uh, poorly defined technological elite with a method in mind and so many things have gone wrong in, in the human interventions in this planet before that people are distrusted on several levels. I think it's important to point out that we're, we're talking about um, humanity's relationship to the biosphere and the planet as a, a, a complex system that we can't hack, that's not the right word, but we might be able to finesse it 
in ways that will uh, keep us from causing a mass extinction event. So we need to talk about it, but it can quickly get scary in several different ways. So what you're finding in the discussion about future emissions at the moment is there's an acceptance that in the second half of the 21st century, in the first half of the 22nd century, something somewhere will be pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But there's no real discussion about how that's going to be done. And that's where moral hazard gets really dangerous because you begin to say, well, always we can trade off emissions cuts now with, um, with more sucking out later. And when you haven't really done the research in a way to find out how you might do that sucking out or whether what level of sucking out is possible. That's very tricky. So there's been a lot of talk about moral hazard with the sunlight mechanisms. Ken Caldera? Yeah, just to build on some of what Oliver was just saying, in Paris at this COP21 meeting, the governments of the world, if you look at what emissions they've promised to uh, try to hold themselves to over the next decades, to, and then they, they claimed this two degree or 1.5 degree targets. In order to meet those targets, the governments basically need to remove large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere later this century. So essentially, geoengineering, at least in the, in the way of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, is the implicit policy of every major government in this world right well, now. Well, some would say that st uh, stop burning fossil fuels, uh, would be a big part of that, that a lot of the technology already exists today, renewables are there, that, that somehow geoengineering is a way to, f to let the fossil fuel companies keep doing business as usual and us to keep living like we do. We can either change ourselves and our behavior and our social and political environment, or we can go for some techno fix. And, uh, and I think there's just a feeling that uh, we need to change our political and social environment and then we can't just rely on technology. So Ken Caldera, where is the status of testing today? Is there any testing going on today, uh, either openly or secretly at the, the US, at the Pentagon or anywhere else? Where, where For carbon dioxide removal, there is testing. There's a pilot plant going on up in Canada right now. And also, of course, planting forests and so on is a form of carbon dioxide removal. For the Sunlight reflecting techniques, basically all the research is indoors at this point, mostly in computers. And do you think it should go outdoors? Do you think that there should be real life outdoor testing of this technology? I think with appropriate safeguards and oversight uh, by appropriate governmental bodies, there should be outdoor experimentation. But I don't think just rogue individuals should go out and uh, do it. Ken Caldera, <laughs> you've been part of a research effort funded by Bill Gates. So tell us, uh, he has a portfolio of investments, nuclear power, et cetera. And how does this fit into his strategy? And, and what has Bill Gates been funding on geoengineering? Well, f first, let's just say that he, he, along with his friends, have raised $5 billion for investment in clean energy technologies. And, and so his investments in clean energy technologies are a thousand times larger than his investments in climate uh, research of this sort. And so he funds uh, my group largely and also David Keith's group and a few other efforts to David do... David Keith is a researcher now at Harvard. Uh, ...to do innovative climate and energy research, some of which is, is geoengineering related, but our work is all with computer models and... Uh, trying to understand the consequences of different things people might do. Um, a few years ago, some of this money did go to fund uh, proof of concept for uh, a sprayer that could potentially uh, whiten marine clouds, but that was all done indoors as a proof of concept. But again, uh, you know, his, his main effort is on trying to affect emissions reduction, and, and he sees that, that there's a lack of research in this area, and was hoping the governments would pick up the slack, but they haven't so far. There's, there's a, a, a scientist at, at the University of California, San Diego, uh, that writes about billionaires buying spaceships, et cetera, uh, and Bill Gates in, in particular. David Victor? Ah, David Victor, yes. Um, no, David's uh, a, very, uh, a, a, a very insightful analyst of the political economy of energy. And uh, David, uh, David's worked a bit on, uh, on, on climate geoengineering, and he dubbed the idea or the, the, he created, the, he didn't create the idea, but he dubbed this idea Goldfinger. And the idea is that 
The thing about putting particles into the upper atmosphere like a volcano does is that you don't have to be all flashy and boomy and multi megatonny like a volcano to do that. You can do that with aircraft or with balloons maybe or something like that. And there's debate about how difficult it is, but it's not very difficult. And in, a, in an era when a man like Elon Musk can you know, build a space fleet, um, the idea of building the capac capacity to alter the planet in, a way, in, in such a way just out of one person's capital um, is oddly plausible. Uh, I mean, the idea that it's possible. The idea that um, the political reality of the world would allow someone to do this uh, without, you know, without shutting them down, that is a little bit less plausible to my mind. And Bill Gates gets pulled into this because I, it's known that Bill Gates funds some geoengineering research at Ken and David's Labs and a few other places. And so when you've got a billionaire um, and you've got this idea that this is, in an odd way, cheap enough that a billionaire can do it. Um, and so... <laughs> To give an idea of the scale of effort, it's estimated that the amount of uh, flights that would, it would take to maintain an aerosol layer, a small particle layer in the stratosphere, enough to offset all of the warming expected this century, would be about one one thousandth the size of the commercial aviation industry. So it would be about the number of flights each year that occur by commercial aviation every six or eight hours. So it's, it's really a tiny economically tiny cost. And so something that sounds like a science fiction novel, Kim Stanley Robinson, we're sitting here talking about it like, oh, a billionaire could do it with a few planes, not that big a deal. I'd like to get your thoughts on how the, this, uh, something like science fiction is becoming closer and closer to just simple possibility. The, the single uh, person changing the world is a very old science fiction story, basically the rocket ship that you build in your backyard and go to the moon. So this is a, a, a really common kind of a Horatio Alger story. But I think it is, will instantly get tangled with governance and will be something that the civilization at large can approve or disapprove, can shoot down or whatever. Um, there are problems with the geoengineering of just uh, blocking sunlight in that if you keep on spewing out CO2, a, a third to a half of it ends up in the ocean. The ocean gets more acidic. If the ocean's more acidic, it may lose the bottom of the food chain, um, and then the rest of the food chain collapses also, and that's a third of humanity's food. So we actually do need to decarbonize as well as these other things. Okay. And the solar geoengineering is a kind of an emergency science fiction story. What if um, temperatures really begin to spike? What if methane begins to get released to the atmosphere off of the ocean floor or the permafrost begins to melt such that the frozen carbon in the permafrost and methane begins to release fast and suddenly it, every year it's like two degrees hotter than the year before and we are clearly reaching a, a, a moment of crossing one of those tipping points into a completely different planet, a jungle planet. At that point then you say we need to put the uh, but, the dust in the air. But that's the one that, re that that's, that sort of scenario is the one that, that really concerns me because that's actually a very common way of framing this story about geoengineering that you hear the idea that it's a sort of like in case of emergency break glass sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And a time when the earth is already going through um, severe climate changes and geopolitical panic is exactly the wrong time to launch a large planet changing sort of, so, sort of, sort of um, effort. Uh, and it's very um, pr prone to, you know, the theory of emergencies that you get in Carl Schmitt and other, other places, that, you know, he who makes the emergency makes the rule. It, it, it fundamentally challenges ideas about democratic, democratic or quasi or pseudo-democratic, democratic, why do I keep saying that, governance in the climate system. It seems to me that it's much, much wiser to talk about introducing small amounts of geoengineering um, at a time when the world is not completely sure. freaked out than large amounts at a time when it is. Sure, but this is a wiser means perhaps less likely to happen. When, when everybody would agree to do something is I think when uh, after you have say the first food crisis, uh, planetary food crisis, uh, something uh, severe enough to shock people. Before that it will be uh, intensely argued and there will never be enough agreement for the world community to do it, and then you get the idea of the, Ra the Rambo um, individual doing it on their own. Uh, if you run the scenarios, there's, there's never a good one. 
uh, for geoengineering unless you start talking about let's uh, uh, reforest all the places that have been deforested, the Pacific Northwest, uh, the Amazon. You can capture 100 gigatons of carbon by reforesting. Let's um, try out uh, geoengineering uh, once in, over the Arctic. Uh, let's let's uh, stabilize population. Um, let's capture the carbon that we're burning when we burn uh, fossil fuels. And do, do you think that doing research also makes it more likely that once there's more money, more funding, more jobs, momentum, that sort of researching something kind of puts it in motion to happening, Oliver Morton? Uh, I think that people worry very much about technical, technological lock-in. The idea that research necessarily leads to deployment, uh, there are examples where it's the case, because most things that end up deployed have been researched, but there are a lot of examples where things have been researched and then quietly let let, let go. And I'm, I'm, I don't think that there's any evidence that geoengineering is particularly pernicious in that respect. Ten years ago we couldn't have this conversation, but the ten hottest years that we have on record uh, took place in this century, so global warming is happening and everybody knows it. The denialists are now uh, a uh, uh, just a fraction of the power that they had in this society 10 years ago. They're going to uh, uh, slink away from this and pretend they never said it. And we are going to be in a world of global warming. And uh, uh, geoengineering is going to be something that's talked about more and more. And it may happen in the good uh, scenario rather than the emergency where, er where once you have a food crisis, everybody's going to be behaving with that level of craziness that won't be good for any, uh, any uh, human decision. You think about... Uh geoengineering, Kim Stanley Robinson, what gives you fear? That people will do the thing they maybe do with the idea that humanity could live on Mars or on some other planet, that they will uh, take less seriously the responsibility to uh, decarbonize fast. Ken Caldera? I think the, my fear is that the same lack of thoughtful societal deliberation that we're applying to GMOs and health care and policy in many areas will also extend to the discussion of geoengineering. It seems that we've devolved into a period where tribalism trumps uh, careful analysis of empirical evidence. And, and I think unless we can make political decisions based on sound information, our society's in big trouble. Let's go to our audience questions. Welcome to Climate One. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Stewart. I'm wondering if you were put in charge today and we didn't, at, let's say, the United States, and we didn't have a crazy Congress, you may be able to get something through and you're running for president. What would you do with geoengineering right away? Oliver, you're British, you're not getting this, unless you'd like to uh, come back as a, <laughs> as a British sovereign, but I don't know. Um, Ken Keldera? Well, I don't want to be too self-serving, but as a research scientist, I, I have to say that I'm in favor of increased research. And, and so, uh, you know, I would greatly increase the research budgets, but, but engage in the research in a way that has a lot of public input and international collaboration. Kim Stanley Robinson, any thoughts? Oh, I bet you'd pay a hundred science fiction novelists to write science fiction novels. Oliver... <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, Morton, you're the environmental editor at The Economist. Many environmentalists think that this, even having this discussion, is harmful and counterproductive to their ends. That's certainly true because there's, um, I mean, there's and there are various reasons for that. Um, and uh, one of them is that they don't feel that this addresses the ultimate cause of the problem. Um, and there's, a, there's obviously truth in that, and, 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 I, I th and I think that it's very important, as I've said before in this conversation, to address carbon dioxide uh, emissions as well as to talk about this sort of stuff, let alone to do this sort of stuff. Um, since you're uh, postulating a, a kind of a, a, a kingly a moment, a carbon tax that increases over time, um, a solar credit so that people could put solar uh, photovoltaic and solar water heating, and also a, a full employment, uh, everybody gets a job that wants one in, in landscape restoration and in um, creation of wetlands, creation of uh, reforesting the deforested areas. A lot of work to be done. And so these things are specific policies that could um, really help in, that, in this situation. <clears throat> Up next, we talk about the United States and a clean energy future. Secretary Moniz, welcome back. 
Uh, I'd like to begin, you know, obviously the Paris Climate Agreement was a big deal, 195 countries coming together, but the New York Times recently ran a lead story saying that the current low cost of fossil fuels and turmoil uh, and concern about an economic um, downturn is presenting a challenge for the Paris Agreement. And they quoted Fatih Birol, the executive director of the International Energy Agency, saying, quote, this will be a litmus, litmus test for the governments, whether or not they are serious about what they have done in Paris. So how is the U.S. going to make good on the Paris deal? And is the current low cost of fossil fuels kind of wind in the face? Well, certainly the low cost of oil uh, affects uh, certain parts of the sector. I mean, it's put a dent into some of the electric vehicle uh, sales. It uh, provides a um, higher challenge, if you like, for next generation biofuels. But on the other hand, I have to say I feel pretty confident that, uh, that we will be able to, uh, to move forward uh, pretty, pretty aggressively. Let me make a few points. Uh, first of all, we should remember that uh, certainly in the United States, uh, oil has essentially no role in the power sector. Uh, and there we are continuing to see uh, the very, very strong growth uh, of wind and solar uh, and other, uh, other renewables. I think that will, that will certainly, uh, certainly continue, uh, particularly as we continue to drive down the costs very, very dramatically in these areas. Uh, if we go to transportation, obviously that's where oil uh, has, a, has a, uh, uh, the dominant role. Uh, but let, let me point out that we continue uh, to push hard in three directions. Uh, one is the continued electrification of, uh, of, of, uh, of vehicles, and we are now over 400,000 uh, electric vehicles uh, on the road uh, in this country, uh, California uh, probably uh, leading, leading the way. Uh, secondly, we continue to uh, develop uh, advanced biofuels, and certainly the requirements for at least a minimal biofuel uh, component uh, are not going away. Obviously, we'd like to see uh, movement towards the more advanced biofuels. But third, uh, we will continue to push uh, in terms of uh, efficiency of vehicles, and something like the CAFE standards, uh, which have us reaching uh, well over 50 miles per gallon uh, for new light-duty vehicles in 2025, those do not depend upon the oil price. Uh, those are there. Uh, we, we are now uh, at an actual fleet average uh, of about 25 miles per gallon uh, and uh, heading up, as I said, to new vehicle 50 plus miles per gallon uh, in, uh, in, in 2025. So uh, I think we will keep making this, this progress. Uh, and as we see exciting technology developments, you probably have seen the recent administration commitment to self-driving vehicles. That's, that is coming at us so much faster than anybody expected. Uh, and when you think about that, it's a pathway again to further electrification, uh, and to offering all kinds of new services to people. So I think it's, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, oil prices go up and down, uh, uh, and uh, that will continue to, continue to be the case. We have a longer-term perspective in terms of the technology and the policies uh, to continue on our, on our decarbonization path. In any particular sectors, is it battery storage? You mentioned sunlight to fuels. I think you mean transportation fuels. Correct. Uh, lighting, buildings, where would you like to see new investors, new innovation happen? Uh, all of the above. Uh, we, we need it across the board. Uh, if we are going to go to a world where carbon emissions and economic growth uh, uh, are not proportional, uh, we're going to need very, very strong demand side uh, progress, so efficiency, LEDs, uh, buildings, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, we're going to need a lot of fuel switching, shall I say, where I'm using fuel here generally, uh, including, including renewables. Uh, we're seeing today the, uh, the shift uh, from uh, coal to gas, uh, natural gas, as a, as a big part of our carbon reductions, uh, for example. Um, uh, and we will have, I believe, uh, a contribution uh, not only from the zero carbon technologies, uh, but also uh, carbon dioxide capture uh, will, will play a role. Um, uh, and I would note that with carbon capture, you know, we have a lot of attention, uh, and I don't want to take attention away from the issue of capturing carbon from coal plants, et cetera. But 
We have a lot of industrial facilities that emit a lot of carbon dioxide for which there, there is, in some sense, no practical alternative other than carbon capture, uh, perhaps utilizing the carbon dioxide. So it's, it's got to be across the board, and it's got to be in the power sector, in the industrial sector, uh, in the transportation sector. You've mentioned falling prices in wind, solar, fossil fuel prices also have fallen. One area where prices have not fallen is nuclear. Prices have risen. Uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of innovation there. Once, a few years ago, there was a talk of a nuclear renaissance in the United States. A few new plants were started. Some old ones have been retired. Where are you on nuclear now as part of this Paris uh, pledge? Well, look, we, we still think that, that, uh, that nuclear is, is one of the options. Uh, that will play an important role in some places and, and not so important a role in, in other places uh, for, a, for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of it is uh, societal uh, decisions. Uh, Germany is an obvious, uh, an obvious example. Um, uh, part of it can be regulatory structures. Uh, for example, in the United States, it's not an accident that the new plants are being built in the southeast uh, where the cost recovery is, is, uh, uh, is, 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 is available. We're seeing in China a tremendous build-out of, of nuclear power as part of their part of their zero carbon. But looking ahead, uh, uh, I will just go back to the innovation theme. Um, uh, one very, in my view, very promising direction are what's called small modular reactors, where rather than building uh, increasingly large nuclear plants, uh, sometimes 1,400 megawatts. Uh, and requiring, you know, fifteen billion dollars of capital for uh, for two units, uh, instead going towards much smaller units, uh, we are supporting at the Department of Energy one that will be heading towards NRC license applications this year for a fifty megawatt unit, uh, very good safety features, etc. Uh, what we don't know and won't know until it plays out is what is going to be the f the full cost. Uh, where the efficiencies of manufacturing can be brought to bear, but will that overcome the efficiencies of scale? So these are open questions, but that's why we are investing in an R&D portfolio uh, and, uh, and moving forward. I'd like to play a clip of uh, former Secretary of Treasury Hank Paulson, who was here recently talking about climate, and then get your reaction. This is Hank Paulson, former CEO of Goldman Sachs and Treasury Secretary under the second President Bush. Well, climate change, I think, is a very difficult issue to deal with. It is, you know, I think the biggest risk not just to the global ecosystem and the environment, it's the biggest economic risk we face. So that's a prominent Republican saying climate is a big risk. Where can Republicans and Democrats agree on climate? They, there was a deal, at the budget deal at the end of last year to allow crude oil exports and extend some renewable energy credits that Democrats and Republicans agreed on that. Where else can Republicans and Democrats agree on climate? Uh, I believe the innovation agenda uh, is really the, really the key. Uh, we have, uh, in, again, in Paris, as I mentioned earlier, on the very first day, President Obama and the leaders of 19 other countries, uh, mostly the leaders, uh, leaders are, are very high-ranking members of the government, announced this mission innovation uh, uh, initiative. Uh, the, uh, we have had extensive discussions uh, about this in the Congress with both chambers, both, uh, both parties. Uh, and the innovation agenda is one that resonates very, very strongly. Uh, it's, it's about also it's advancing business uh, in addition to advancing our climate goals, our security goals, our economic goals. Uh, it's also going to be about building new infrastructure. Uh, labor is all into the innovation and infrastructure agenda. Uh, so I think the, uh, look, the reality is in Paris, certainly no one can dispute the fact that every country in the world basically came forward and said we have to address this. Now, there may be individuals who would like to take a different position, but I have not heard any of them take a different position on innovation, on the fact that the United States has always led in innovation, that it gives us tremendous opportunity uh, uh, economically, uh, and I think that's the key. Um, so this year, um, uh, 
frankly, in the next months, we are going to see uh, as the Congress uh, starts debating an energy bill, uh, as the Congress addresses the appropriations, I can assure you that the uh, administration is committed to its mission innovation commitment of doubling energy technology R&D over the next five years. That translates into a 15 to 20 percent per year, whether you compound or not, uh, uh, increase. Um, we have every intention of certainly trying to work with the Congress to, to establish that, as will the other 19 countries that have, that have joined with, with us. And I might add that, uh, and perhaps the next panel will address this, that this mission coalition, mission innovation coalition of 20 countries, expanding the innovation pipeline, it has been done in collaboration with what's called the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, which is 28 investors from 10 different countries putting billions of dollars on the table with increased risk tolerance and patience for returns to get some of these breakthrough energy uh, projects going forward. So this is tremendous leverage on both public and private sectors. We're getting 20 countries to double R to technology R&D to provide more investable opportunities for, frankly, deep-pocketed investors, again, from many, many countries and many continents. So, um, so I think this is, this, is, this is the message. This is the bipartisan message. Uh, this is the message that will, again, I think carry us across the finish line in terms of the dramatically increased ambition we will need uh, in the decades ahead. Please step on up to the uh, microphone and make your, uh, we'll get through as many of these questions crisply as we can. Hello, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Wayne, I'm a member of 350.org. Uh, Paris was a great event, but it only, even if everyone got and made their pledges, it would only uh, bring uh, uh, the temperature down to, or, or restrain the temperature to about 2.7 degrees Celsius. So in that sense, Paris has not done what is needed. Can we somehow increase the speed at which we're going to solve this problem? Because it's not an incremental problem. So uh, look, I, I think there's, well, we're all, this, well, I think, I think we're all on the same page that uh, obviously climate, uh, climate risks are, are one of the one of the absolute major risks that we, we face, uh, uh, and uh, we need to be aggressive uh, in, in addressing it. Now, Paris, as you said, uh, and I thought I pretty much said it, uh, is that uh, the Paris commitments uh, in and of themselves uh, uh, will not take us to the two or even lower uh, degree centigrade uh, warming that uh, uh, we feel is prudent not ideal, <laughs> but, but at least prudent. Uh, the, that's why, of course, those commitments are now made typically between 2025 and 2030. And so after that, we are going to need more ambition, maybe even before that. Uh, and that's why I said the other part of the story of Paris, which, of course, does not get as much attention after the uh, end of Paris, is this innovation agenda. If we continue to innovate and drive down the costs of the clean technologies, that will permit the more aggressive ambition going forward. That's what I mean that, that we, you know, we're not finished in 10 years, we're just starting in 10 years. And so the innovation is part of it and it'll work together with policy uh, to, to get us to the, to the very low, very, very low carbon future uh, that we need. Let's have our next question for Secretary Moniz. Briefly, Hi, please. I, I'm a 30-year EPA employee, and uh, when I started in 1984, we were talking about what are we going to do with the, uh, the waste from nuclear power generation, and uh, that's something that we're going to have to get on top of sometime. It's going to be an integrated process. There's no such thing as totally clean energy because we have to deal with, with that waste. So uh, We had the first of a set of uh, public hearings, uh, public meetings uh, to uh, request information. Uh, I won't go into great detail, but what is called a consent-based process to all forms of uh, nuclear spent fuel and high-level waste handling. Uh, storage facilities, uh, geological repositories, 
deep boreholes, uh, which we are starting an experiment on. Uh, so we, we, are, we are launching kind of a new, uh, a new push uh, towards uh, all forms of managing the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. Next question. Dave Masson, Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, thank you, Secretary Moniz, for your efforts in Paris. I understand that pricing carbon was not on the agenda there, but it was a part of important side discussions. What's your view of uh, the role that pricing carbon, say a tax on fossil fuels, could play? And do you have hopes about a role for Congress in bringing that to the U.S.? Well, I certainly feel that, uh, that pricing carbon uh, is, uh, is the simplest economy-wide approach uh, to, uh, to addressing uh, carbon. Uh, and uh, personally, I think that we will eventually uh, get there. Um, I think it's clear in the current political environment that we're not ready to get there uh, uh, immediately. Uh, but the administration, the, the president's climate action plan, uh, is, uh, is really addressing and accomplishing significant reductions through existing administrative authorities. Uh, the issue there is that in doing so, we therefore need to ad address it in some sense in a, se in a sectoral way, like the clean power plan for power plants, uh, the CAFE standards for vehicle efficiencies, uh, etc. Uh, ultimately, uh, a carbon price uh, would probably be the most simplest w the simplest way to get economy-wide and to, I think, to give the most certainty uh, to industry and everyone else in terms of understanding uh, the, the, the future. This is the last question. Uh, welcome to Climate One. Saw today that China announced a price floor for oil. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that and if the U.S. would ever consider such a policy. Well, I, 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 the, the, the Chinese, I think, are, like others, uh, taking advantage of the low, the low oil prices to, uh, in some cases, by the way, and I'm not saying about China specifically, but uh, in many cases, uh, countries that have been providing enormous subsidies uh, are using the low oil price as a chance to lower the subsidies uh, without having a, as big an impact on their, on their consumers. Uh, but I think, look, I think the issue in the end is that uh, we have to keep uh, of our focus, as we are in the United States, by the way, uh, in terms of lowering our oil dependence. Even as we are producing more oil, you know, we are still big net oil, Im uh, big crude oil importers. Uh, and so we will continue uh, to address lowering oil dependence, again, through three principal thrusts efficiency, alternative liquid fuels, electrification of vehicles. That's, that's, our, that's our program. Still to come, we discuss the Paris Climate Accord. Hal Harvey, let's begin with you. You've said that there are two Americas, not a red America and a blue America, but a green America and a brown America. Tell us what you mean. <laughs> So uh, with, with deference, of course, to Energy Secretary Moniz, a very large fraction of American energy policy is set state by state. 60% of the nation's carbon goes through monopoly pipes and wires. And those are regulated individually by state public utilities commissions. Those public utilities commissioners get to decide whether your utility bill lands on green choices or brown choices. And in states like California, which has near one-third renewable energy and will soon have 50% renewable energy, they're landing on green choices. But there are other states, Nevada recently made a horrible reversal, uh, and they're insisting, in effect, that your money go to brown choices. So this is substantially driven state by state. Lyndon Rive, there is uh, some areas where clean energy is playing defense. Nevada's one. Uh, in Georgia, the state recently reduced uh, incentives for electric vehicles. Sales plummeted. So tell us about where you're playing offense and where you're playing defense. Oh, right now, it just feels like we're playing defense left and right. Um, the, the, the amount of attacks coming on to the uh, solar industry is insane. Um, you know, just coming back from, from Paris... You know, one of the big takeaways is the countries are investing now to, to make this change. Um, but the only way you can truly make this change is you have to give the choice to, to the public. You have to enable the technology for the public to actually use it. 
But if the monopoly is prote uh, protecting their, their infrastructure and, and not allowing that change to occur, it's really difficult to, to make that happen. And Nevada is a classic case. Um, the industry has done a great job of moving forward, reducing costs, making it more affordable, allowing more and more uh, lower income neighborhoods to, to go solar. Um, but then with one swipe of, of the pan, the PUC decimated uh, the solar industry in Nevada. There is no solar industry. It's, it's gone. So it's not like reduced, it's gone. And uh, it's a shame, especially when, when it's a state where most of the energy is imported and most of it's coal and natural gas. And how did that happen? Is it because the incumbent utilities have more influence at the state house? They have more muscle? So unless you have um, a, a legislation or a PC that wants to go and, and, and stands the importance of, of selecting green over, over brown, um, the incumbent infrastructure the relationships they have and the investments they've made into uh, policy has, has been going on for 100 years. And so, so that relationship is highly captive and has it's been going on. And so, uh, for a long time, they made these investments. And so unless you can get the public to weigh in, you're going to end up with roughly the same result. And the result is protecting their profits. Danny Kennedy, there is some uh, upside here. Job growth, solar jobs are growing, solar deployment is growing. Tell us, tell us the, the positive side of the story. Well, the truth is we've been succeeding as a clean energy industry now for over a decade, particularly in job creation, which should be important to all of us coming out of the recession. Solar, for example, created a couple hundred thousand jobs. So that there are now more people employed in the solar industry than in the oil and gas extraction industry in America. There are now more solar installers, just that occupation, half of the value chain, if you will, than there are coal miners in America. And that's at less than 2% of electricity supplied. So as we grow to 10, 20, 50 in California, where we're under mandate to do so, we will employ many hundreds of thousands more Americans as these clean energy businesses grow. So great news story there. Plus we're lowering costs of electricity for families and businesses across the country. Plus we're cleaning the air and reducing the risks of climate change. That we there are places where people can make choices, uh, various flavors, various colors of green. Is that happening across the United States where people can choose where they get their elect electrons from? There are a number of electricity markets that have opened up to customer choice in different ways. Uh, and one interesting example actually is Texas. So the first renewable portfolio standard in the country was signed by Governor George W. Bush. Uh, they met that with wind in no time whatsoever. They doubled it and they beat the records on that. Texas now has more than twice as much wind as California. It was initiated by policy. It was enabled by Texas's willingness to put in transmission lines to the wind field. So that was a certainty that a wind developer could look at and use right away. And finally, it was enabled by the possibility of bilateral sales so the wind companies could sell directly to the customers, and many customers preferred this. Some preferred it for environmental reasons, but many preferred it because the long-term price of wind is exactly the same as the short-term price of wind once the windmill's built. Zero fuel cost. That's an incredible advantage. So there are many ways to get at this, but fundamentally, public policy is an enabler or inhibitor, and the difference... Uh, is clear in the markets that have happened. If you look at the dramatic decline of solar prices, 80% drop in the last five years, it was kicked off by good policy and enabled by further good policy, and that creates a zero carbon energy alternative that's entirely affordable. On affordability, uh, Lyndon Rive, uh, last year, another cabinet secretary of President Obama, uh, uh, Julian Castro, was here, concerned about making green energy accessible and affordable to lower income Americans. It's perceived to be an elitist, upper middle class, you know, coastal thing. So how, are, what are you, how is clean energy getting to uh, you know, less, Americans with low, less income? Yeah, so just to be clear, let's nail that one in the head. That's propaganda from the utilities. That's not the case, okay? If you look at the, all the growth, all the growth in the industry today, majority of it is in low to moderate income neighborhoods. Danny Kennedy, you look at uh, the broad clean tech sectors. What are some of the hot sectors that you look at where you see a lot of exciting, excitement and promise? There's a, a bunch of new um, work being done in storage, energy storage, which California's real center of gravity for with the national labs here engaged in consortia to help advance startups providing batteries and other forms of storage. I'd say another area of innovation, to follow up what you were discussing with the Secretary, isn't just the hardware innovations that are needed, but the financial products and 
the software technologies that are needed to make this bi-directional grid that we're going to live with work. You know, and, and to speak to the, the solar industry's growth in America, much of that was facilitated by financial product changes and improvements and innovation in that arena. So, you know, financial engineers, software engineers of the world get involved because that's the startups that are needed as much as uh, some new particular piece of hardware. What Solar is what, 2% maybe of U.S. electricity now? What's needed to get it to 5 10%? What's the path? Yeah, so... so this is, in, this is where government can play a really important role. Um, having a policy that enables making use clean energy easier, let, let's not make it harder. Um, what, what we often find when we start getting traction is that when you get traction, uh, the, the uh, uh, incumbents leverage their policy relationships to slow down the adoption. Like, oh wait, this is actually starting to work. We're actually starting to solve the problem. Let's make it harder. Um, so, so to, like, wow. And, and they, actually, they actually give presentations of, like, potential growth trajectories. Well, look how good it's going to grow. We've got to make sure that that growth trajectory slows down. Like, thank goodness we, we, some states have really good uh, 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 leaders in, in, in this role. And if, it's up to them to make this work. And it's binary. If they do it right, growth occurs. We solve the problem. If they do it wrong... Um, it decimates the market and there is no renewable energy. California is often seen as a clean energy leader. It was seen as a clean energy leader in Paris very much, both at the city and state level. And yet California's success is not, its trajectory is not secured for the future. Some of the laws that Governor Schwarzenegger assigned will, will expire. A new governor in California in 2018 could go in a very different direction. Is that true? So California enjoys what I call a virtuous cycle. So when you create good policy, you create good industries behind it. And you create workers for those industries and customers. And they become a new political force. So when Governor Brown was the youngest governor in California's history, he instituted a very progressive building code that self-tightens every three years. And at first the builders were against this. And then they realized uh, it levels the playing field and it keeps out the schlock. And so new products came along, better windows, better air conditioners, better roofing materials, better insulation, and buildings got more and more efficient. Every three years, the code tightened up. This survived through Duke Majin, Wilson, Schwarzenegger, Davis, I didn't get the order quite right, but Republican and Democratic governors alike. And that's where we're headed in California, and that's where we're headed nationally. By 2018, I think this virtuous cycle that has just been described as going to be even more entrenched in California with more jobs, you know, back to Lyndon's point also about the monopoly utilities. We now already employ more people in the solar industry than the five big utilities in the state, the IOUs and SMUD and Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Plus, we're going to employ many more in the years to come and create these businesses that, that are then exportable to the world, that the ministers of 24 countries are coming to see in a showcase here in California in June of this year. You know, that's the next big wave. There's something in the order of 9 to $12 trillion in the next 25 years going to be spent on energy, not here, but in other countries. California wants a piece of that action. I can't imagine our politicians and leaders in three years' time stepping backwards from their leadership position. It's actually some competition between California, Oregon, and Washington for those jobs, and their governors claiming that their clean policies are driving economic growth and job growth. Hal Harvey, what do you think of the Paris deal? Is it sort of is it just a gesture, or is it is it a meaningful step forward? It's 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 a real deal. What's important about Paris, the most important thing about Paris is that everybody came to the table with a plan to decarbonize their economy, and what will matter is whether that gets done. What Paris did was sanctify the political movement and create momentum. Where we have to turn our attention now, and this is absolutely crucial, is especially in the big nations helping ensure that they end up with the right building codes, the right utility policy, the right and the end to subsidy of fossil fuels. So it's, it's the nuts and bolts, sector by sector, policy actions that go away from Paris in the top 20 countries that determine our climate future. It's that simple. Lyndon Rive, the Paris deal is going to affect a solar city's growth, going to affect the solar industry? Does it help yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, when you look at developing countries, uh, solar is, is, is clearly something that, that, that can help them. It, it helps with grid stability when you start adding uh, storage to it as well. Um, uh, the big challenge now in developing countries is, is financeability. So it's not a technology issue. The technology is available, but it's financeability. 
So out of the uh, out of Paris is commitments from uh, the developed countries to help with the financing. And so it will take a while for that to go through the system and how we actually get access to the financing. But when, when that access to the financing becomes available, you'll see a lot more deployment of renewable energy in, in the developing countries. Danny Kennedy, where can an average investor put some money into a mutual fund? They want to invest in solar. They did that in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. People got burned badly. Uh, where can people do it today? I'm obviously not going to provide investment advice on the radio, but uh, <laughs> there's plenty of good companies out there, plenty of funds uh, that retail investors can actually get involved with, and um, there are going to be increasing flows of bonds and various forms of debt to get uh, behind this amazing capital flow which will be unleashed by Paris. You know, to Hal's point, I think the key is going to be what actually is done after the words and if the ratchet mechanisms are used to create a virtuous spiral like we've had in California here with policy over time. If that is the case, then as I mentioned earlier, there's some estimates that suggest, you know, the amount of money flowing into renewable energy will go from something like six trillion dollars in the next 25 years to nine or 12 trillion, depending on how much of the pie we take in terms of new energy. We're going to invite your participation. Welcome to Climate One. A theme that we've heard today is the economic um, potential of the clean energy transition. I was at a panel at the Clean Tech Forum where they were talking about robots and automation in the work uh, in the industrial force. Can you speak to how that fits into this picture um, long term in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and we're just going through this right now. We, we're both building a, f a factory in uh, New York, it's going to be the largest uh, solar manufacturing factory in, in the Western Hemisphere. And we're looking at, at automation and the robots moving things around. There's a lot of innovation that can occur there. Those robots are super expensive. It makes no sense when you do bottoms-up cost analysis of what those robots should cost. Um, and uh, and they clunky. They, they actually don't provide such great automation. So it's, um, it's, it's a very challenging part of the manufacturing and I, th I think there could be a tremendous innovation there. That's tough news for people hoping on that that plant in Buffalo will create lots of jobs. Is there a tension there between robots and job creation? So, so, so the number one job creator in the solar industry is actually delivering solar on somebody's uh, house. So, so um, yes, even if you automate the full factory, you're still going to uh, create a lot of jobs. Um, but the manufacturing has this appeal that it, it's, it's the elite uh, jobs, but installers make more money. They, 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 you know, good installers can make a good income, and it is uh, highly distributed. It's not concentrated, so, you, so everybody gets the benefit of the job creation versus just one specific location. And uh, the ratio is like, dramatically different. Like, uh, our factory in uh, Buffalo is, is going to make about a gigawatt the forecast is about 1,500 people in that factory. Um, today, we, are, uh, we, we install about a gigawatt as a company, and we have 15,000 employees. So, so it, it's a big delta. And those installation jobs can't be shipped, uh, shipped offshore to China. Let's go to our next question. Welcome. Hi there. Oliver Harris here from Tower Power. Uh, just focusing on some of the poorest parts in the world, of the world where people don't have access to <laughs> energy at all, What's your view on the role of distributed renewable energy microgrids to provide the power that they need? Yeah. This, <laughs> favorite subject David, because Danny uh, Kennedy. <laughs> so there's going to be an enormous growth of that over the next several decades. So of that sort of multi-trillion dollar market, sounds like funny money. Much of it is going to be bottom of the pyramid, if you will, bringing light and other electricity services to people of Asia, the half of India that doesn't have electricity to date, and all of Africa, including the burgeoning population there. So it's an enormous space. It's an enormous opportunity to do good and uplift lives. Uh, and it's already booming. I mean, I think the off-grid electric scene is becoming a, a hot market, if you will, a bit like the solar industry here in America about eight, seven years ago bunch of announcements at this forum that people are at this week in San Francisco of funding and equity rounds and all that sort of good news. Um, and hopefully that will just grow globally as we deliver this thing we all take for granted called electricity, but which can really improve people's lives across the globe. Yeah, we're super passionate for that. We've invested in a company actually called Off Grid Electric um, in, in Tanzania. And the model is essentially dis displacing kerosene. And see a small solar panel, um, uh, four or six LED lights, little battery. Uh, it provides a far better uh, form of light, 
way healthier um, uh, and uh, way safer um, uh, at a lower price than just burning kerosene. So, so, so you think of the, the sales model, you, you're coming home one day and you've got your neighbor with this nice light hanging out and versus you and the, with your little kerosene um, lamp and you ask your neighbor, how'd you get that? And, and your neighbor tells you it's cheaper than the kerosene. So like, it's going to be massive, massive growth in that sector. Okay, let's go to our next question. Hi, thanks for coming and speaking with us this evening. So we've talked a lot about Paris and um, you know, how to make sure there's action after the talks. And uh, Mr. Harvey, I'd love for you to talk to us about how you think countries are going to keep each other, um, you know, keep each other honest to their own commitments and specifically the role that the United States will play in that. I think the actual monitoring of progress is going to be pluralistic. There's a lot of citizen observations we can see. There's more and more web reporting. More and more sensing is unfolding across the world that lets us see what's being used and what's being burned. You can, you can do a lot of this with what they call national technical means without necessarily believing what's self-reported. So <clears throat> I think we're going to have report cards on the web for every major country that tell you how things are going. What's more important, or at least as important, is that the citizens of those countries demand increased energy efficiency and increased renewable energy, cleaner air, and reduce climate risk. Because it's the domestic political pressure, not the international political pressure, that's gonna make the big difference. And then finally, <clears throat> the main narrative of Paris from my perspective was, in Copenhagen was all about burden sharing. And Paris was all about opportunity. And that's a 180 switch. So you don't need to have such draconian measures when it turns out to be in your economic interest to do the right thing. It's not, it's not a done deal, it's not a coasting slope downhill all the way. I don't want to be sanguine about this, but the wind is definitely at our back. <laughs>